Hello, my name's Lauren and welcome to the study skills session. In this session, we're going to be looking at how to understand and interpret data. In this session, we will look at three key areas. We will learn how researchers use data. We will understand descriptive statistics and we will understand why the spread of data is important. These three objectives are particularly important for subjects such as science and maths. OK, so to begin with, let's think about how we conduct research. When we conduct research, be it in the social sciences or the natural sciences or in mathematics, what we are doing is we are selecting a sample from a wider population. This is because we cannot test every single person in a population. This would be impractical to do. So what we do instead is we select a representative sample from a population to run our research. Now we have our sample, let's think about some research questions that we might like to find out about. On the slide, you will see a number of research questions. Some are hypothetical and magical, such as do gnomes work harder than elves? And some are more practical, such as do students work better on Monday morning than they do on a Friday morning? And what effect does daily use of Facebook have on people's attention span? These are all research questions that we should be able to address through using data. You might have some of your own research questions that you're interested in. If this is the case, pause the video and write down some research questions that you would like to find out more about. We have our research question that we might be interested in. And crucially, whatever our research question is, in order to answer it and to understand it fully, we need to collect some form of data. Now, often when we run studies and we run research projects, the type of data we're collecting is numeric. So we're collecting number data. And when we collect data from a sample, which represents our population, what we want to do with that data is we want to be able to describe the patterns and trends that we observe. And this is where descriptive statistics comes in. So when you have your data, often what you'll have is lots of lots of data representing each of each of the individuals that have taken part in your in your research. And what we want to do is we want to bring that together to give us a picture of your data to show us what are the important patterns and trends that we can see. And the ways in which we can describe our data include we could report what the average age is of the sample. We could report the average test performance for the people that took part in our research. And fundamentally, researchers rarely report the raw data. And this is because simply there's too much of it. And actually, it's not very informative. It doesn't really tell us what's going on. To do that, we need to use descriptive statistics, which are ways in which we can reveal patterns and trends. And there are two methods that we can use under the umbrella of descriptive statistics. So we can report the measures of central tendency, also referred to as the average. And you might be familiar with this from some of your lessons at school where you've looked, looked at things such as the mean or the median. And another really important method, which you may be less familiar with, is called the variance. And the variance refers to the spread of data. So how spread out are our data points within our data set? And I'll be saying a little bit more about variance later on in this session. As I said on the previous slide, measures of central tendency, the average, is one way in which we can describe our data. This should be familiar 
from some of your classes. But just as a reminder to recap, the measures of central tendency is a single value that describes your data. And what the measure of central tendency is doing is, is it's telling you about the centre point, the average in your data set. And you may remember that there are three types of measures of central tendency. There's the mean, there's the median, and there's the mode. I won't be going into detail about these measures of central tendency in this session, but if you're interested in finding more about these, then you can look these up. Now what I want to do is to look at an example of a study to see what descriptive statistics is telling us about the data that we collect. So I'm first going to describe the study that you see in front of you. So this study was conducted two times, study one and study two in two separate laboratories. Both studies did exactly the same thing. They got a sample of individuals and they put them into two groups. One group, called the five hours sleep group, had five hours sleep and then they took part in a memory test and the scores are presented in the bar chart. The study also took a second group called the 10 hours sleep group and asked individuals to sleep for 10 hours and then complete a memory test. And again, the scores were recorded in this bar chart. And this happened across both studies because we were interested in whether the amount of sleep affected individual's memory score. And what we see, what the bar chart is showing us, is it's showing us the average. It's showing us the mean memory score for individuals in the five hour sleep group and individuals in the 10 hour sleep group across both these studies. Looking at these bar charts, what do you think you can conclude from study one and study two. Pause the video for a moment and think about what, what this data is telling us. So you can now see the same bar chart in front of you. And when you pause the video and thought about what the data was showing us from the previous slide, you may have said something like, individuals in the 10 hour sleep group have a higher memory score than individuals in the five hour sleep group. And that this is the same across both study one and study two. So the findings are replicated. Now what I've added to this bar chart is I've added the variance. So the variance is about the spread of data. And what I've done is I've, I've added a data point which represents each person that's taken part in the study. So each purple cross that you see represents a person. It is one data point. And you can see that in each group, you have four participants or four people taking part. Now looking at how the data is spread out around the mean, around the average, do you think the data is similar in study one and study two? Hopefully your answer was no, because actually what we see is there's very little variation because the data, the data points are not spread out around the average in study one. They're actually clustered very close to the mean. But in study two, there's lots of variation. So we see some individuals in the five hour sleep group performing very well on the memory school test and actually comparable to how the 10 hour sleep group are performing. And likewise, we see some individuals, some of the crosses in the 10 hour group who are performing very poorly on the memory school test. 
and actually a scoring similarly to the five hour sleep group. So if I were to ask you whether for study two, the amount of sleep is improving memory scores, looking at the variation, looking at the variance, probably say you're, you're not confident, you're not sure, because actually the amount of sleep appears to be having a very different effect on individuals within each of the groups. It's resulting in scores that are very high, but also scores that are very low. If we move across to the study one group and we ask the same question about whether you were confident about whether more sleep improved the memory score, you'd probably say yes, because actually the impact of the sleep is affecting each individual in a very similar way. They're all scoring similarly in the 10 hour sleep group. And they're scoring similarly in the five hour sleep group. And the 10 hour sleep group is scoring higher, consistently higher than the five hour sleep group. So this is why variance is really important, because if you just look at the measure of central tendency, if you just look at the mean, we're not fully understanding what is the spread and what is the variation of data. And this is really important when we do research. OK, so to reiterate and summarise why variance is important, the spread of data, which is the variance, gives us an understanding of how well the mean represents the data. And that's what we were really seeing on the previous slide. And so if there is a lot of variation in the data, this would suggest that the mean is not a good representation of the data. And this is because such large variation suggests that there's large differences between individual scores. And again, this is what we saw on the previous slide with study two. And when we think about how this applies to research, it is often considered positive if there's little variation in the data set, as it suggests that individual scores are similar. And again, this is what we saw in the previous slide on study one. We saw all of the individual data points clustered around the mean, which would suggest that the impact of sleep, um, of, of a lot of sleep and a little amount of sleep is impacting on the individuals in a similar way within each of the groups. And there are many ways to calculate variance in statistics, and I've not got time to go into all of these today. Before I finish the session, I will say, say something briefly about one way in which you can calculate variance, and this is called the range. So to calculate the range, what you need to do is you take the largest score in the data set and you minus the smallest score in the data set. On the next slide, we will now look at how to do this. Calculating the range is really straightforward. And as I said previously, what you need to do is you take the largest number in the data set and then you minus the smallest number in the data set from it. So you can see in this bar chart, we have test scores at the bottom. And then we have the frequency at which those test scores occurred. And we have this for two different groups. And for simplicity, I simply call this group A and group B. Now, let's think about how we calculate the range. So we're trying to calculate the range for the green bars and the range for the purple bars. And we want to understand which group has a larger range. I'd suggest pausing this video for a moment and trying to calculate the range yourself and then restart the video when you're ready and I will walk you through how to calculate the range and you can see if you were correct. Okay so firstly group A. So I'm interested in identifying what was the largest number and what was the smallest number in this data set. So group A is the green, the green bars. So I can see that some individuals in group A scored eight. Eight is the largest score in this data set. And then I want to look at what was the smallest score in this data set. And again, by just looking at the bar chart, I can see that there's a, there's a green bar at number one. So one is the smallest score in the data set. So to calculate the range, as I said, I'm taking the largest and the smallest number. 
So that would be 8 minus 1, and that would give me a range of 7. If I then repeat this for group B, which is the purple group, I can see that the largest number in the data set for the purple bars is 6. And I can see that the smallest number is 3. So again, if I do 6 minus 3, so taking the minusing the smallest from the largest number, as I did with group A, I get a range of 3. And so in answer to the question, which group has a larger range? My answer will be that group A has a larger range than group B. And if you look, at the spread of data in the bar charts, visually you can see that this is correct. There's more data spread out across a larger range of data points in group A compared to group B. This brings us to the end of this study skill session. Thank you very much for listening. On this final slide, I presented a summary of the key points that we've discussed during this session. So, as a reminder, researchers rarely report the raw data, and this is because there's simply too much of it, and it's not particularly meaningful. Instead, what researchers do is they use descriptive statistics to understand patterns and trends within the data. And there are two main methods that you can use for descriptive statistics. These include measures of central tendency and the variance, which is what we looked at in detail today. And we, we understood why the spread of data is important and what it tells us about a particular data set. And in research, it is, it is considered positive if there's little variation in the data set, as it suggests the individual scores are similar. So a particular manipulation or a particular group is being affected in the same way. This now concludes the study skills session to complete the session fully, please click on the link below to complete a short multiple choice quiz to test your knowledge. Thank you for listening.